Today, I'm going to present another poem by Li Shangyi. This poem is in the title of Wu Ti or No Title. It is probably the most mysterious poem of the Tang Dynasty poetry. Many scholars have been debating about what the poem is about for over a thousand years. Although the poem was labeled as no title by Li Shangyin, to distinguish this poem from all the other poems labeled as no title, this poem is often referred as Jin She, or the decorated Caesar, because the poem starts with these two characters. So I'm going to follow the tradition referring this poem as Jin She, or the decorated Caesar. As shown in many of my videos, most scholar officials gave their poems titles that clearly expressed the intention of their poems. Some of them even added an introduction to explain when and under what circumstances a poem was composed and what kind of feelings he or she intended to express so that people would not misread or misinterpret their poems. But not Li Sangyin, not in this poem. I have talked about the possible reasons in my first video why Li Sangyin labeled one of his poems as Wu Ti or No Title. Here's the link to my video if you would like to check it out. But for this poem, no one really know what Li Sangyin intended to express. He used the seemingly unrelated imageries, legends, historical or mythical figures in one poem, making it almost impossible for people to guess what is it that he expressed in this poem. Recently, Professor Chai Zhongqi from the University of Illinois made two videos about this poem by Li Sangyin. Professor Chai summarized the many different interpretations of this poem and added his own interpretation. Unfortunately for some of you, his videos are presented in Mandarin. So I take the pleasure to incorporate some of his interpretations into this video so that the people who do not understand Mandarin can get a glimpse of Professor Chai's view on this poem. I have consulted with Professor Chai Zhongqi about citing the content of his videos. He kindly agreed. I'm very grateful for his support for my channel, and I think you would also benefit from his research about this poem and his interpretation of the poem. I have included the links to Professor Chai's video in the description section down below. Another scholar I would like to mention is the scholar and poet Ye Jiaying. She is an expert of classical Chinese poetry. She taught Chinese poetry in Taiwan, USA, and mainland China, and published many, many books on classical Chinese poetry in both Chinese and English. I listed the links to her first video of the full video series on this poem in the description section down below. You can check out her videos if you like. I also did quite a bit of research on other scholars' interpretations about this poem. So here is what I got. I'm Dr. Gao, a philosopher obsessed with poetry. I make videos about the classical Chinese poetry, philosophies, and medical literature. If you like the content of my videos, please click the like button and subscribe my channel. I also offer one-to-one -one online lessons on these subjects. So if you would like to know more about these subjects, please contact me. Here's my email address. Now, let me read the poem in Chinese first. 
，锦瑟无端，五十弦，一弦一柱，思华年。庄生晓梦迷蝴蝶，望帝春心托杜鹃。沧海月明珠有泪，蓝天日暖玉生烟。此情可待成追忆。只是当时已惘然。Now let's look at the first couplet. 锦瑟无端五十弦，一弦一柱思华年。锦 is a kind of colorful silk produced in the region around today's Chengdu in Sichuan. The character 锦 consists of two characters of 金 or gold. And bo or silk, jin was very hard to make and super expensive. Its price is as high as the gold of the same weight. So jin uses the sound of the character jin, and the character bo indicates that it is silk. Here is the link to a video clip I made a while ago about the names of different kinds of silk in Chinese. Jin here is used to describe the beautiful patterns decorating the scissor. So David and I translate the jin as decorated. Si is a musical instrument lost for many years in China until 1973. One such instrument was unearthed from a Western Han Dynasty tomb. Here is the picture of this instrument, currently on exhibition at the Hunan Museum. Wu means no. Duan literally means the two ends of something striped, such as a stick. It is also used to refer to the origin of things or the reason for doing something. So Wu Duan simply means to have no reason. Wu Shi means fifty. Xian refers to the string on the scissor. Yi means one. Xian means string. Yi again means one. And Zhu refers to the thread on the scissor. 一弦一柱 emphasizes the act of counting each and every one of the strings. Si means recall, Hua means blossom, Nian means year. Hua Nian refers to the useful years of one's life. So the two lines can be translated as: the decorated scissor has fifty strings for no reason. One by one, the string and thread recall my blossoming years. 庄生晓梦迷蝴蝶，望帝春心托杜鹃。庄生 refers to the Taoist philosopher 庄子。晓 means dawn, 梦 means dream, 迷 means confused. 蝴蝶 refers to butterfly. This line alludes to the story told by Zhuang Zi in the book named after him. The story goes something like this: One day, Zhuang Zi was having a nap during the day and dreamed that he was a butterfly flying around happily. Soon he woke up, but was a bit confused. The dream was so real and vivid, making him wondering. Was it him dreaming that he turned into a butterfly, or was it now that the butterfly was dreaming it turning into Zhuangzi? Wang is an abbreviation of Xi Wang, meaning hope. Di is often translated as emperor, but this connotation only started by the Qin Dynasty when the first emperor put the characters of Huang and Di together to create a new term, which was later simplified as Di, meaning emperor. All the kings from the Song Dynasty were referred as Di after they passed away, but were referred as Wang or King while alive. Since Wang Di was way earlier than the first emperor, so we translate Di as King.
Wang Di was the king of an ancient kingdom, Shu, located in today's Sichuan province. He was a kind and capable king. A fugitive named Bie Ling or Turtle Spirit from a neighboring kingdom, Jing, arrived and was able to help to control and manage the flooding problem at the Shu kingdom. King Hope was very impressed and abdicated his crown to Bie Ling. Wang Di then retreated to the mountain and became a hermit. However, after Bie Ling became the king, he started abusing power for self-indulgence and inflated huge suffering on the people. Wang Di regretted his decision. After he died, he turned into a cuckoo, calling Buru Gui Qi, or I would rather go back. Of course, this is just one version of the story. There are many other different versions. But I won't have time to tell all of them. Professor Ye Jialing told a different version of the story. You can check out her version if you like. Chun means spring, xin means hot. Chun xin is often used to refer romantic thought because spring is the time for renewal, generosity, and romantic love. Spring is also the time that young girls were allowed to go out for sightseeing and visiting temples. So spring is the rare occasions when young men might get a glimpse of young women. Here, Chun Xin not only refers to romantic thoughts the poet held for his wife, but also ambitions he might have when he was young. So David and I translate it as spring passion. Tu means in trust. Du Jian refers to cuckoo. So the two lines can be translated as Zhuang Zi dreamed at dawn of a butterfly and was confused. King Hope entrusted his spring passion to the cuckoo. Chang Hai Yue Ming Zhu Yu Lei Lan Tian Ri Nuan Yi Sheng Yan. Chang refers to the dark blue color. Hai means ocean. Yue means moon. Ming means bright. Zhu means pearl. Yu means half. Lei means tear. This line allures to the legend about the human like merman and mermaids living in the South China Sea. They can wave a translucent waterproof fabric and sometimes sell the fabric to the people living on the coastal region. Living in the boundless ocean, these merman and mermaid were often lonely and cry, and their tears will turn into pearls. The pearls will become round and lustrous under the bright moonlight, absorbing the yin energy from the moon. On the left is a picture of a merman from Shanghai Jing, the classic of mountain and ocean, while on the right is a modern depiction of merman. How different! Lan Tian is the name of a mountainous region located in today's Shanxi province, known for producing high-quality jade. Here is an unearthed jade piece from the Han Dynasty tomb. Jade has been mined from this region from prehistorical time. According to legends, high-quality jade emits a misty vapor under the sunlight. Only an experienced artisan can distinguish from the normal mist so that they will be able to find the jade buried in the mountain. Ri means sun, nuan means warm, yu means jade, sheng means gave up, yan means misty vapor. So the two lines can be translated as the bright moon on the dark ocean, the merman drops a tear of pearl, the sun warms blue mountain, and the jade gives up a misty vapor. 
，此情可待成追忆，只是当时已惘然。此 means this， 情 means feeling， 可 means can， 待 means wait， 成 means become， 追忆 means recollection， 知 means only， 是 means is。当时 means at the time. 已 means already. 惘然 means in the days. So the two lines can be translated as: Could this feeling have waited to become a recollection? It was only in the days at that time. Jin Se was mentioned in several poems Li Sangyin composed for his wife after she passed away. Apparently, she was very good at playing this instrument. The zither had a special meaning for Li Sangyin and his wife. So every string and every fret of the zither reminded him the happy times they spent together. The line "Yi Xian Yi Zhu Si Hua Nian." It's such a beautiful poetic form that not only sounds elegant but also very touching. The linking phrase of "e something something" and "e something something" is not only rhythmic but also imply a repeated action. I can imagine that Li Sangyin was caressing the strings of the zither one by one. While recalling the happy days with his late wife for the hundredth time, how deep was his love for her, and yet how heartbreaking was this scenario? The second and the third couplet first side drawn the story of the butterfly dream, then the mythical story of King Hope, the myth of merman and mermaid. And the mystery of Jed at Blue Mountain. The poem concludes with a rather peculiar couplet, stating that he was confused as he was in the days years ago. The dreamlike happiness he had with his wife, the best the hope and ambition. The lonely nights and the moonlight and the wonders he witnessed over the years, these are all flashing through his mind, carrying him like a torrent stream. No one during the Tang Dynasty write poems like this. No wonder scholars have been debating what this poem is about for more than a thousand years. Professor Chai Zhongti argues that this poetic style created by Li Sangyin is a groundbreaking innovation in the classical Chinese poetic tradition. He believes that Li Sangyin was using a technique most people think was invented during the 20th century called stream of consciousness. Professor Chai claims that. In this poem, there is no theme that holds the poem together. There are only streams of fragmented imageries, fleeting sensations and emotions, and nothing makes sense on its own. Yet, these imageries and feelings are neatly integrated in an elegant poetic form. He also claims. What we thought a new poetic style called Meng Long Shi or misty poetry emerged during the 1980s and 90s in mainland China was not completely new. Li Shangyin had invented this poetic style more than a thousand years ago. Rather than focusing on The real scenarios and strong, tangible feelings, such as Li Bai and Du Fu, Li Sangyin was expressing feelings and sensations and emotions beyond the words. So the poems of this style often read like a floating mist, although it is certainly out there, but one cannot grasp its real meaning. This is how 
This style of poetry gets its name as misty poetry or Meng Leng Si. I totally agree with Professor Chai Zhengqi. I'm not an expert on the structures and forms of poetry, of classical Chinese poetry. Professor Chai is. If you can understand the Mandarin, I highly recommend you watching the two videos presented by Professor Chai Zhengqi. His interpretation and analysis of this poem are amazingly insightful. They can help you to really appreciate the beauty of classical Chinese poetry. I'm Dr. Gao, a philosopher obsessed with poetry. I make videos about the classical Chinese poetry, philosophies, and medical literature. If you like the content of my videos, please click on the like button and subscribe my channel. I also offer one-to-one -one online lessons on these subjects. If you'd like to know more about these subjects, please contact me. Here's my email address. Thanks for watching my video. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.